Hello everyone and welcome to lesson three of physics. Today we're going to be talking about kinematics, which is probably one of the biggest topics in all of physics. It's the first real big important topic you're going to come across, that's for sure. And before we even get talking about anything with the equations today, because there's a lot of equations that we'll have to know, the first thing we want to talk about is how acceleration is the change in velocity. In other words, you can define acceleration and I would write this down, I would define acceleration as speeding up or slowing down. Because that's basically what acceleration is. How do you have a change in velocity? Well, you're speeding up or you're slowing down. And so then we come down here to these two terms, constant velocity and constant acceleration. The number one mistake I see people make in this topic is they don't know the difference between velocity and acceleration. That's like not knowing the difference between a fruit and a vegetable. It, you're not gonna, it's not going to go well for you if you don't know this fundamental difference. So constant velocity is defined as the object speed and direction are not changing. Acceleration is zero. Can anyone give an example of something moving at constant velocity? Like if you're on a highway and you're just like you're sticking to the speed limit, just like you're not Exactly. If you're on a highway, you're going 60 miles per hour and you're not changing your speed and you're also not turning, that's constant velocity. And why do I have to say not turning as well? Because if you turn, you're changing your direction. And if you have velocity, that's also not just the speed, but it's the direction too. So you have to be going down a straight highway in order to have constant velocity. How, and then constant acceleration is defined as the velocity is changing at a constant rate. This one I'm going to give the example for. Imagine you're at a stop sign, or a stoplight, I mean, it's a red light, and the light turns green. And what do you do? You press on the gas pedal, you press on the accelerator. And do you ever notice why it's called an accelerator and not a velocity, ve accelerator, velocitor? Yeah, it's, it's called accelerate, accelerator, not a velocitor. In other words, the reason why you press the acceleration pedal or the gas pedal is because you want to accelerate, you want to speed up. And so for that reason, when you press the gas pedal and you start going forward, and let's assume that you hold your pedal at a constant rate, that's what constant acceleration looks like. And the reason why we care so much about constant acceleration is because when you do have constant acceleration, you get to use kinematics, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So first I have three tables here for us, and I would like to know which of these tables have a constant acceleration. I'm going to do the first one. I, I'm going to do all three, but here's the first one. You see the time is zero, then one second, then two seconds, then three seconds, and you see the velocity is changing as you can see here. If I want to know acceleration, it's the change in velocity, which means what's the change from zero to one? It's plus 10. What's the change from 10 to 20? Again, plus 10. And the same thing with 20 to 30, plus 10 each time. Because the change is the same, yes, we do have constant acceleration for that first one. Any questions on that first table? And again, this would be the example where you're at a, a red light and then it turns green and then you start speeding up. Now for the next one, we look at this table. I'm gonna do the same thing. We start at 10, we go down to zero, so that's like minus 10. And then you go from zero to 10 again. So in other words, that's plus 10. And then when you go from 10 to 20, that's plus 10 again. Is this constant acceleration? No, because it's changing from negative 10 to positive 10. In other words, this is not constant acceleration. And what an example of this would be in real life is let's say you're going forward, you come across a stop sign, you come to a stop, and then you go forward again. That's exactly what's going on in the middle. And then the last example is the trickiest. We start at 10, we go down to zero. As you can see, that's minus 10. You go from zero to negative 10, that's another minus 10. And then you go from negative 10 to negative 20. Again, you're subtracting 10 each time. And since it's the same number each time, even though it's negative, you do have constant acceleration. Now, hopefully we start to get the idea of what constant acceleration looks like. And the last thing I want to say is if we do have constant acceleration, then that means we get to use the kinematic equations, which are the most important equations in all of physics, in my opinion. And here they are. Now, I have them all written out for us. 
honestly, that's not helping you because if I have them written out, it means you didn't write it out, you didn't memorize it, and that's a problem. So I'm gonna tell you, you need to have these memorized or in the very least, you need to know which equation to use because there's four of them, right? How do I know which equation to use? It depends on the problem. We're gonna be doing a bunch of examples today. But before we do any questions, I just wanna break down each variable because there's five kinematic variables out of these four equations. And let's write them down. The first one is VI. That's gonna be initial velocity. Initial velocity. The next one you see is VF. VF is simple, it's final velocity. After that, we have A, which is the acceleration. Now acceleration, there's no initial and there's no final. Why not? Because as we said, the acceleration is constant. It's a single number. Let's say it's five. It's gonna always be five if it's five. Next is T, which is time. And then the last variable, it's the trickiest. It's delta X. And what delta X is, it's your displacement. How far are you moving? Which we talked about displacement in week one. Any questions on any of those? And then the cool thing is there's five variables. We need, that was a poor need. We need three of the five to solve for the rest. We need three of the five to solve for the rest. So for instance, if you have VI, VF, and acceleration, then there must be one of the four equations that will give you the remaining two quantities. Any questions? Okay, then let's continue. So we have our first example problems. Number one, a car at a stoplight accelerates uniformly from rest to 30 meters per second in a time of 10 seconds. What is the car's acceleration? So my advice for you is for any kinematics problem, write down the knowns and unknowns. So for instance, it says it starts from rest. That means I know V initial. My initial velocity is zero because it's starting from rest. It then says it accelerates from rest to 30 meters per second. That means my final speed must be 30 meters per second. Writing the units is optional. I like to do it personally, but it's up to you. It says the time is 10 seconds, so T equals 10 seconds. And right there, I have three of the five, which means there must be an equation that will solve for, well, part A is asking for the acceleration. So let me scroll back up to the four equations, and I need to pick the right one. I've got a 25% chance. There's only one that will work. And I'll give you a hint. How do I know it's the right one? It's the equation that it does not, does not have delta X in it. Why not? Because delta X is displacement. For part A, I don't need displacement. And if it asks me for displacement, I'm not gonna know it anyway. So it wouldn't make sense to choose that equation. So then I'm not using, well, actually it's just the first one. The first one's the only one that doesn't have delta X. So that's what I'm gonna write. I'm gonna write V final equals V initial plus AT. And by the way, let's say you choose the wrong one because you're not as smart as me, I get it. But the good news is it's really easy because you'll just get stuck and then you, that just means you choose a new equation. Oh, and by the way, if you don't have three of the five, like you should always have three of the five. If you don't have three of the five variables, read the question again, you probably missed one. So next, V final, we said that's 30, equals V initial, which is zero, plus 10 times T. And that simplifies to 30 equals 10 T, divide both sides by 10, looks like T equals three seconds. And there we go. Any questions there? Okay. So for part B, Wait, how- Can I oh, ask a ahead. question? Yes. Why would the unit be three seconds? Like for acceleration, how would we figure out like the units? Would it just- Oh my God, Wait time I missed up. I'm sorry, I'm a, thank you for pointing that out. I made a big mistake. I plugged in 10 for A instead of 10 for T. Luckily, the answer is the same. I just have the wrong variables. I'm sorry. Oh, I just assumed that you switched the variable signs as we were doing the problem. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you the problem. The problem is that I gloated about how smart I am, and that is guaranteed to get me 
or the wrong answer because I'll make a mistake because I'm too cocky. So that that's the reason why I got it wrong, actually. So never be cocky. Acceleration is three meters per second squared. Okay, thank you. And then part B. How far does the car travel during the 10 seconds? Now it's asked to solve for displacement delta x. <clears throat> and the good news is, <clears throat> excuse me, and the good news is once you have four variables, because now we have four of the five, literally any of them will work. Like for instance, let's do the second one, which says delta x equals v initial times time plus one half at squared. So delta x, the displacement, is what I'm solving for. V initial is still zero. T is 10 plus one half times A is three times T is 10 squared. And I have all my variables, like I can just plug this in a calculator and it'll spit out the right answer. 150 meters is the distance traveled or the displacement. And I know those are technically two different things, distance traveled and displacement, as we talked about in week one. But in this case, they're the same. Why? Because we're moving in a, in a straight line. How do I know it's a straight line? Because the very first sentence, the car accelerates uniformly. Accelerates uniformly means constant acceleration, which means we're we must be going in a straight line. Any questions? Then in that case, we're on to number two. Number two, in my opinion, is the hardest question of the night, unless you know how to do it. Now, I'm going to do it the hard way first, and then I'll show you an easier way afterwards. A red car is at a stoplight. As the light turns green and the red car starts accelerating, a blue 2020 Kia Forte, very smooth ride, if you remember that was a reference to last week, passes by. The velocities of both cars are shown in the figure. How long does it take the red car to pass the blue car? So you can picture this in your head. Just imagine you're at a stoplight, okay? There's a red car there stopped. The light turns green and the blue car speeds by because it didn't have to slow down. The red car now has to play catch up but since the red car has a higher acceleration, eventually it's going to pass the blue car. That's what's going on here. Now, if you look at this graph, and I were to ask you, where does the red car pass the blue car? Obviously, the answer is right here at two seconds. And obviously, you guys should not be using your intuition, intuition because the time is not two seconds. This point right here is not where it passes. I tricked you. So something must be going on here because the lines intersect. That's right. That point right there is where they have the same speed, but not the same distance. What's the difference? Well, I think you know as well as I do. Let's say you're running behind someone who's really fast, okay? And they get a head start. And let's say you now have the same speed as them because they, they start slowing down or something like that. Now, you still have to play catch up. Why? Because even though you have the same speed, you started behind them. And that's exactly what's going on here. The blue Kia Forte had a huge head start. But now, after two seconds, now it can actually start catching up to the blue car. But how do we actually find that distance? Luckily, I do the same thing for every problem. I ask myself, what are the variables I need to know? What are the equations? And then I solve. So, for instance, for the red car, for the red car, I would say, I know the initial velocity is zero. How do I know that? Look right there. That velocity is zero, and this is a velocity versus time graph. So velocity initial zero, velocity final, I don't know. I don't know the final speed. I do know the acceleration. Why? I know the acceleration because acceleration, and this is something that we kind of learned in week one, acceleration is the slope of velocity. And what is the slope of the red car? Looks like the rise is 10 and the run is 2. So the acceleration is 10 over 2. The slope is 10 over 2, which is just 5. So I have the initial. I have acceleration. I must need one more thing, <clears throat> but I don't. And that's kind of a problem. But the good news is it actually doesn't matter. We'll find out why in a minute. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing for the blue car. Okay? So for the blue car, here's the thing. The acceleration is 0. How do I know? Well, the slope is zero, okay? Now, when your acceleration is zero, then you get to use the equation from river physics from last week. And I'm not talking about the angle that you need to go straight. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying the equation, 
velocity equals de delta x over t, distance over time. And again, you get to use that whenever the acceleration is zero, which for most of today will not be the case. Most of, the, most of today, the acceleration will not be zero. So anyways, I do know the velocity. The velocity is 10, because just look at the blue line. It's always at 10. And then delta x I don't know, and I also don't know t. That's okay. So now I need to basically have another equation for the red car using the kinematic equations that will solve for delta x and for t. Which equation will that be? I'll show you. It's the equation, it's basically the equation that does not have v final because v final is nowhere to be seen. And that is this equation, delta x equals v initial times time plus one half a t squared. The bad news is you won't know all the variables. The good news is it does not matter. It does not matter. So delta x, I'm going to start plugging in variables. V initial is just zero, which means the t doesn't even matter. Anything times zero is still zero. Plus one half times acceleration is five, and then t squared is also unknown. So basically what I have here right now is delta x equals, we'll say five halves t squared, right? This is the most simplified you can get it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to plug in this delta x, we're going to plug this right there into the other equation. And you'll see that we'll get the right answer then. So now I'm going to have on the left side 10. On the right side, I have 5 halves t squared divided by t. Now hopefully you're good at math and you know your properties of exponents. If you have t squared over t, which is what I have right here, then one of the t's cancel out and you're just left with a normal t. In other words, I get 5 over 2, because that did not cancel, times t, equals 10. And then all you need to do is multiply by the reciprocal, because that's how you get rid of fractions. So in other words, when I'm saying, you want to get rid of 5 halves? Fine, multiply by 2 fifths. t equals 10 times 2 fifths. Just multiply by the reciprocal. And you'll get an answer of 4 seconds. And that is when the cars pass each other. Now, as I said, this is technically the hard way, but the good news is we do have an easier way now that we know the hard way. And if I go back up to my picture, which I will right now, look at four seconds right here, okay? That's where the cars actually pass each other. What's special about the red car and the blue car at that time? At first, it looks like nothing. The red car is clearly higher. But here's the secret. <clears throat> if you remember we talked about from week one, if you want to find the distance, you look at the area under the curve. So in other words, the area of that red triangle is one half times the base four times the height 20, and you're going to get 40 meters as a distance. Then if you do the same thing with the blue, the blue is nice because it's just a rectangle. The area of the blue is just a rectangle, so base times height, four times 10, looks like the distance is 40. Those distances are the same. You get the answer a lot faster. Any questions? Okay, that's it for this one. Next we have number three, just kidding. Okay, projectile motion, yes. So first we went over kinematics. Projectile motion is basically just a special category of kinematics. Every example we've seen so far has been like a car, right? Projectile motion is something like a javelin. Imagine you're throwing a javelin through the air. And what path will that javelin take? It's going to take this kind of path, right? It's going to have a parabola kind of shape. And that's exactly what I want you to think of when you think of projectile motion. I want you to think of a ball or an object or a projectile flying through the air. And here's how we're going to solve projectile motion problems. Basically, they're the exact same thing as normal kinematics problems, except now you have to worry because if you look at my picture, there's an x-axis and a y-axis, and that's never good in physics. So we have to break it up into two different axes. For the x-axis, here's what you're going to do. First of all, the acceleration, I want to tell you, is zero for the x-axis. How does that make any sense? Well, remember, acceleration is speeding up or slowing down, right? When I throw a ball up in the air, is it speeding up or slowing down in the x-direction? Like, do I throw a pen up in the air and suddenly it starts going east? Probably not. It just stays in place, right? The thing is, the pen is going up and down. That's the y-axis. 
And remember, even if you throw a ball, like a baseball, across a field, it's not speeding up in the X direction. It's not slowing down in the X direction. It's having the same speed in the X direction. But it is going up and down in the Y direction, so that's why for the Y direction it's going to be a lot harder. But for the X direction, X axis, A equals zero, which simply means you do the equation velocity equals delta X over T. It's the distance over time equation. The other thing I want to mention is this velocity right here, it's not the initial velocity, it's not the final velocity, it's the X component of velocity. So again, going back to week one or even week two, when we found the X and Y components of velocity, well, good news, we get to do it again today. I hope you like your Sokotoa because you'll need it. Now that's it for the X axis. For the Y axis, much more complicated because the acceleration is not zero. What I recommend you do, I recommend you write out the five kinematic variables, V initial, V final, acceleration, time, and delta Y. Notice I switched from delta X to delta Y. Aren't I so clever? And that's because we're talking about the Y direction. And does it matter if you call it delta Y or delta X or anything else? No, it doesn't really matter, as long as you know what you're talking about. And one thing that's cool, and I have it as a note down here, the acceleration due to gravity, in other words, we always know, we always know the acceleration from gravity. It's a known constant. Scientists have tested it a, a long time ago, like back in Newton's day, they knew this. Isaac Newton, who was born in like the 1700s. So that acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And sometimes you'll see it written as negative lowercase g. That is not a nine, that is lowercase g. And g stands for the acceleration of gravity. And I'm not going to exactly explain why they use negative g. It makes sense at the end of the year with physics, but for right now, we're just going to use negative 9.8. I like to use negative 10 because it's so close to negative 10, but traditionally students hate that, so we will not. We'll use negative 9.8. Okay, and then the last thing I want to say for the y-axis, what equation are you going to use? You're going to use the kinematic equations to solve. And that's that. Any questions before we go into some example problems? Uh, okay. Could you explain the, what is it, the negative G again? I'm kind of confused. What does it mean? It means negative 9, as far as you're concerned, it means negative 9.8. Now, why do they say negative G, right? So G is the universal gravitation constant for Earth. In other words, you know you're you weigh less on the moon, right? So in other words, mm -hmm. G would be a different number for the moon. G would be a different number for Saturn. But G for the Earth is negative 9.8. Does that make sense? Okay, I see. I was a bit confused why that number. Yeah, it's, it's specifically for Earth. And basically what this means, let's just pretend it's 10 for a second, okay? If you pretend that this is 10, and it's ne actually negative 10, right? Because which way does gravity point, up or down? Gravity points down, that's why it's negative 10, approximately. So what that means is if you want to drop a ball from the top of the Empire State Building, what this means is every second, if you have a, a little stopwatch or a, a watch or a clock or whatever, and you time yourself, every single second, its speed is increasing by 9.8 or 10 meters per second every second. That's what that means. So after five seconds, you know the speed is approximately 50 because you just multiply it by 10. After eight seconds, you're looking at about 80 meters per second. And you can easily do that math for, for basically anything. Now, we're going to do some actual examples of this, and we're going to look at some hard ones. Number three, you throw a ball straight up with an initial speed of 15 meters per second and then catch it as it falls back down. Part A, what is the ball's speed when it reaches its peak height? I'm going to draw a picture of this to help us understand it. So imagine we have a ball here. It's thrown straight up with a speed of 15 meters per second. That ball is going to go up, 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 reach the peak height, and then come back down like this. And then, you know, we catch it at the bottom. But the question is asking about the speed at, when it's at the peak height, whatever this peak height is. And the secret to the speed at the peak height, speed at P 
peak height and therefore the velocity as well. I'm just going to tell you it's the same for this one. Speed at peak height is zero. Always. Always. No matter what. Well, actually, I have to, I have to clarify that. It's the, it's the y speed. The x speed may be different, but the y speed is zero. Now, if you look at the ball here, the ball is thrown straight up. So, yeah, the y speed is zero. That makes sense. Any questions on that first one? Okay. Part B, what is the ball's acceleration when it reaches its peak height? Here's another answer for us. The acceleration, and again, you can say the y acceleration, but yeah, I'll say the y acceleration. The y acceleration is always negative 9.8, no matter what, no matter what. And again, that's technically not true in real life, but for this class it is. So in other words, no matter where you are in the, in the flight path, whether you're at the beginning, whether you're at the end, whether you're at the middle, it's always going to be negative 9.8. And the reason why is because where does acceleration come from? And this is a little of a preview to next week when we talk about forces. Where does acceleration come from? Forces. In other words, if the acceleration ever changed, it means the force of gravity is changing. If the force of gravity is changing, you should be very concerned because that means we've, we've, uh, we're, we're probably in trouble. So gravity doesn't change, therefore the acceleration of Earth does not change. And so it's negative 9.8 everywhere. Does that make sense? And then finally, part C. Go ahead. Um, but what happens when we're like accelerating the ball? Or, it is, or is it just when it leaves our hand? There's just yes, that's a good speed. question. That's a very good question. Everything we're talking about today is the moment it leaves your hand and the moment before it hits the ground. Because a lot of times students will say, oh, it hit the ground, the final velocity is zero. And that's just like not right at all. I think you're missing the point. I'm not saying you're missing the point. You didn't even say that. But the students who say the velocity is zero when it hits the ground, you're missing the point because the velocity final should be the moment before it hits the ground. So anyways, if we want to, follow the, uh, if we want to find the ball's peak height, now we're talking about the kinematic equations. So I know V initial is 15 because it tells me. I know V final is zero because we just said it. We just said the final speed at the peak is zero in part A. We also know the acceleration is negative 9.8 because we said that in part B. And look at that, part C now just became a lot easier. Now, since I'm solving for height and I don't want time, I need to use the equation that has no time. If I go back to my kinematic equations right here, the only equation that doesn't have time is the third one. I call it the squared one because it has squared terms in it. So then back here, we're going to have V final squared, that's zero squared, equals V initial squared, that's 15 squared, plus two times the acceleration, which is negative 9.8, times delta X, or I guess in this case, delta Y, which is what I'm solving for. And now I can start plugging in the variables and solving. So 0 equals 15 squared is 225. Plus, that's, that, that's minus, actually. 2 times negative 9.8 is negative 19.6. Delta Y. I feel like I don't need to explain how to solve for delta Y here. But just in case, you add 19.6 to both sides. 19.6 delta Y equals 20. What was it? 22, 225? Yeah, 225. And then you just divide by 19.6. Delta Y is going to equal 11.5 meters. Any questions on the distance? Okay, next. Part D. What is the ball speed when you catch it? This is what I'm talking about where students say, oh, you caught it and it's not moving anymore. It's zero. I'll tell you, the ball speed is never zero. Okay, so how are we going to find this? Well, let me draw a picture again. This picture is going to be very similar to the one I drew before, but it's going to be just ever so slightly different. So I've got the 15 meters per second going up. You'll notice this time I did not draw the ball at the peak height. Why not? Because when it comes to kinematics problems, and I haven't said this yet, I've taken it for granted so far. 
But whenever it comes to kinematics problems, you need to pick two points in time. You have to. In this case, I want to pick the first point, the initial I, when you throw it. And I want to count the final F when you catch it. So because it's a different point in time, I'm drawing a slightly different picture. That also means all the variables and all the equations I just had in the last page, none of them will work. I'm sorry. But the good news is I know what V initial is. V initial is 15. I'm solving for V final. I don't know what that is. I know the acceleration is negative 9.8. And delta Y, I'll tell you this, delta Y is not the answer we just said. Delta Y is not, was it 11.5 I think I said? It was on the other page? Yeah, it's not 11.5. Why not? That's a good question. Because 11.5 is the distance it goes up and down. But remember, what does delta mean? Delta means y final minus y initial. Look at where the final is. The final's on the ground. Look at where the initial is. The initial's also on the ground. In other words, the change is zero. Zero minus zero is zero because the distance is not changing. And that's something that's gonna trip up a lot of kids. But not you guys, right? Yeah, we'll see. And the last thing I do wanna say for delta y, this is not related to this problem, but it comes up later in this lesson. If your delta y is positive, then that means you're going up. And likewise, if delta y is negative, then that means your object is going down. And that's a handy thing to know because that can definitely make the math confusing if, if you mess that up. So, I'm assuming you have this written down now. If not, the recording exists and you can pause the video there. But now I have three of the five. I want to solve for V final. And again, I want to use the no time equation, just like before. So that means V final squared equals V initial squared plus 2A delta Y. V final squared is what I'm solving for. V initial squared is 15 squared plus 2 times negative 9.8 times delta Y is 0. Since anything times zero is zero, this whole thing goes to zero. And that means V final squared equals 15 squared. And if you want to solve for V final, then all you got to do is take the square root of both sides. Now remember, whenever you take the square root, it's plus or minus. And does this matter? Yes, it does. What would a positive V final mean? Well, if V, it doesn't matter if it's V final or V initial, but if V is positive, then that means you're going up means you're going up. And if V is negative, then it means you're going down. Now remember, we're solving for V final right now when you catch it. When you catch it, is the ball going up or down? It's going down. So in other words, what I'm saying is the answer should be negative root 15 squared. You plug that into calculator. You'll just get negative 15 because the square root and the squared cancel. And that's your velocity. Oh, and it's meters per second. Now, the funny thing is, the answer is not negative 15. It actually is positive 15. Why? Can someone tell me? Can someone read the question and tell me why? Speed. Yes, speed. Oh. And speed is the absolute value of velocity. Speed equals absolute value of velocity. And that's, why, and that's why you read the question every time. 15 meters per second is the final answer. Will you lose points for that? Probably not unless it's a multiple choice test and you see both answers, positive 15 and negative 15. Then they're trying to trick you. Well, not trick you. They're trying to see if you know what's going on. They're trying to assess your knowledge, basically. So that's that. Any questions? Okay. We've got two more questions to go today. Number four is the most famous example in all of physics class. In other words, I guarantee you no matter who your professor or teacher is, you're going to see number four, something like number four in your class. A cannon fires a cannonball horizontally off the side of a cliff with a speed of 100 meters per second. That's pretty fast. At the exact same time, another cannonball is dropped off the cliff with no initial velocity. The cliff is 50 meters high. Which cannonball will hit the ground first? And I want you to think about this actually before we actually solve the problem. I'll even draw a picture for us. So basically what we have going on here is we have this cliff. 
That's not a good cliff. Uh, that's better. Okay. So the cliff is 50 meters high. The first cannonball is launched with an initial speed of 100 meters per second, completely horizontally. And as you can imagine, that cannonball is going to hit the ground something like this, probably. The other cannonball is dropped, and that's just going to go down like that. It, it hits the floor eventually. Now the question is, which one's going to hit the ground first, and why? Do we have any brave members of the audience who want to get the wrong answer? I have a feeling of... Sorry. Oh, I don't know. I, um, yeah, I'll, I, I'll hear both of your answers. Renak, you can go first. Yeah. So I have a feeling that they are both going to hit the ground at the same time because I feel like the force acting upon them, like the negative force going down, is the same. Okay. Julia, what is your response? I think it's the one that's being dropped down, like, directly. Okay. And we will see which one of you is right. And just so uh, no one chose the... Uh, the horizontal one. So I'll choose the cannonball that's fired. Okay, and we're going to see which of the three of us is right. So here's what I'm going to suggest. First of all, I want to give a hint. If you want to find anything with distance, notice this has the x and y axis in it, right? Because clearly this is going in both the x direction and the y direction. If you are solving for distance, then use the x axis. If you are solving for time, use the y axis. That's a good tip in general when it comes to kinematics. Now, since we want to know which cannonball hits the ground first, that means we're solving for time. And so I'm going to start with the y axis here. And there's nothing wrong with doing the, the x axis. It's just that it's probably not the most direct route to the answer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing for both. I'm going to say, let's make a category for dropped and that we'll make a category for launched and let's see what variables we have here. So for the dropped, V initial is zero because it's dropped from rest. V final, I have no idea. I don't really care either. Acceleration is always negative 9.8 no matter what. Time is what I'm solving for and delta Y is 50. Does everyone agree with this? I do not agree with this. What mistake did I make that I mentioned five minutes ago? Is delta y supposed to be negative or? Delta y should be negative. Why? Because we're going down. <laughs> Very good. Most people don't catch that. And by the way, if you do mess that up, it's not the end of the world. It just means at some point in the problem, you're gonna get a negative square root and you're gonna freak out, <laughs> which isn't good. But what I tell most of my students, when you get a negative square root in physics class, not math class, math class is a different story. But if you get a negative square root in physics class, you can probably ignore the negative because you probably messed up somewhere. Now, you should always check your work and make sure to confirm that. But I'm telling you, normally it's okay. Not always, but most of the time. Okay, now for the launched. What's the initial for the launched? It's zero, I think. Why is it zero, even though I have this big fat 100 right here? Because that's for the x-axis. That's exactly right, and that's the secret to this question. So basically, since the x-axis is what the 100 is, that's the x-axis, and the y-axis is zero, why? Why is the y-axis zero? Because all of the 100 meters per second is going horizontally, which is the x-direction. The y-direction is completely even. In other words, you're not firing the cannonball up, you're not firing the cannonball down. It is completely horizontal. So V initial is zero. And then I'll go through the rest of these quickly. V final, I don't know. Acceleration, again, does not matter. Always negative 9.8. Time is what I'm solving for. And delta Y, it's the same cliff. So negative 50. In other words, since both of these have the exact same numbers, it doesn't matter which equation you use, you're going to get the same answer it's going to be the same time. And this is the most famous example in all of physics. And now you can spoil it for the rest of the class. Actually, don't do that. Don't be a jerk. Your professor, your, your physics teacher, you know, they get excited when they teach stuff like this to kids, like I do. So don't spoil this for the rest of the class, even though you're so smart and you know it ahead of time. Although, 
if you ever do impress the teacher and say, you know, impress them with a smart answer, then of course you got to say, they're, they're going to ask you, oh man, Jimmy, how on earth did you, how, how would you know that? And you're going to say, oh, because I have the greatest tutor in the world, Dan the Tutor. And they're going to be like, who? And, you, and then you can just send them the link to my website. And, uh, and that's that. So thank you for the free publicity in the future. Anyways, that's it for number four. The last problem, number five, is going to be the hardest question of the day. I also want to say, I believe there is a question in the homework that's like ridiculously hard. Like, I think I just put a question on there that I made too hard that even I couldn't have solved it when I was in your shoes, which means you probably won't be able to. It's the football question. And the, the football question here that we're doing today is a lot easier than the one I put in the homework. But... I still want you to try it, and of course, I'll show the solutions after a few days. Number five, a football player kicks a football on a flat field with a speed of 30 meters per second at an angle of 45 degrees. He then kicks another football also at 30 meters per second, but with an angle of 60 degrees. Which football stays in the air longer? The secret to this question is realizing, let's, let's draw two pictures, okay? So the first picture, I have 30 meters per second, and it's a 45 degree angle. Okay, there's my first picture. My second picture is basically the same thing, 30 meters per second as my velocity, but that one's at an angle of 60 degrees. The secret to this question is you need to make two right triangles because that's what we love to do in physics. We love making right triangles. There's 45 degrees, right angle, that hypotenuse is 30, and we have Vx and we have Vy the velocity. And then I do the same thing for the other one. The hypotenuse is 30. The angle is 60 degrees right there. It's a right angle. Again, Vx and Vy. Now let's see how I solve for Vx and Vy. First, I'm going to say, if you want to solve for Vx, for instance, you're going to need cosine. You're going to need the cosine of 45 degrees. Why? Because cosine is the adjacent, which is Vx, divided by the hypotenuse, which is 30. So you get Vx over 30. If you want to solve for Vx, you need to multiply both sides by 30. So Vx equals 30 times the cosine of 45, which we can plug in a calculator later. Now, if you want to do the same thing, but you want to find Vy, then it's basically the same idea, except you do sine 45 equals vy over 30. And the reason for that is simple, because sine is the opposite leg, which is vy, over the hypotenuse, which is 30. And that's why it's so important that we talk about this in week one, and that you understand it now, or else this is just really confusing. And then if you want to do the same thing, solve vy by multiplying both sides by 30, it's going to be 30 sine of 45 degrees. Okay, then we end up doing the exact same thing with the 60 degree triangle. It's literally the same idea. I'll just cut the, to the chase. Vx equals 30 cosine 60, because all the numbers are the same. You're just changing the angle. And Vy equals 30 sine 60 degrees. So there's all of our x components and our y components. But you'll notice we didn't actually answer the question yet. Which football stays in the air longer? So remember what I said earlier. If you want to find time, if you want to find time, then you're looking at the y-axis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on vy. I'm going to find all the components because I just want to make sure I know them all. But I'm going to focus on the y. So in other words, for the 45 degrees, I plugged it in a calculator earlier today. Vx, which was, remember, 30 cosine 45, that's 21.2 meters per second. And vy is going to be also 21.2 meters per second. 45 degrees is a magical angle. It's the only angle in the world. Well, I guess that's, at least in quadrant one, forget what I'm talking about. 45 degrees is the only angle that has the same X and Y component. And the reason why I said quadrant one is because technically 135 degrees is also a 45 degree angle because of reference angles, but who cares about that? Let's just talk about 45. And then for 60 degrees, for 60 degrees, same idea. Vx was 30 times the cosine of 60, which is 15 meters per second. And Vy is going to be 
we got 26, yeah, 26 meters per second after I plugged it in the calculator. So if I'm looking at the y-axis, which one has the bigger y velocity? That one. So in other words, I'm going to say that the 60 degree angle is in the air longer, is in the air longer. And my reason why is because it has a bigger y component of velocity. And if you don't believe me, then you can plug it into a kinematic equation because V initial is the same thing as, let's say, 26. Notice it's the Y component only. V final, I don't know what V final is. Acceleration is negative 9.8. The time, we also don't know. And delta Y is going to be, yeah, I'm going to tell you it's zero, but can someone tell me why it's zero for delta Y? Let me go back to this page. Mm, oh, yeah, I didn't draw it. Okay, well, let me just show you. So basically, when you kick a football and you kick it here, and it's got some angle, you're going to end up where you started. Delta Y is zero. You didn't go up or down. And that's going to be true whenever you kick on a flat field. Whenever you kick on a flat field, it's always going to be zero for delta Y. And since you have three of the five variables, you can solve for whatever you want. We want to solve for time this time. You use the equation that doesn't have the final in it. That's this equation, delta Y equals V initial times time plus one half AT squared. You don't have to write any of this down. I'm just, I'm just showing you. Well, I guess if you want to write it down, you can. But what I'm just trying to say is if you plug in these variables, what you're going to find is whoever has the bigger Y component of velocity, they're going to have the longer time, guaranteed. And that makes intuitive sense if you think about it. So we answered part A. And then the only thing left to do is solve part B. Part B asks which football goes farther. In other words, we are going to look at the x-axis because, as I said earlier, distance, you look at the x-axis. Now, remember, for the x-axis, you're just using this equation. Vx equals delta x over t. That's all you need. Okay? Now, for Vx, we'll start with the 45-degree angle. For Vx... Vx is, what was it? I wrote it on the other page. Let me see. We said it was 21.2 right there. So it's 21.2 equals delta x, which I don't know, divided by time, which I also don't know. So it's ironic because now I have to go back to my other page and solve for time. And I should have just done that in the first place, but whatever, we're doing it now. So what I'm saying is you need this time you need this equation. Why this equation? Because we we're actually like 90% of the way to finding the time. Like we wrote out all the variables. We found out we had three of the five. And if you have three of the five, it means you can plug it into a kinematic equation. And we chose the kinematic equation that did not have V final, which is this one. And now all I need to do is plug in. So delta Y is zero. V initial is 21. Oh, well, this was the 60 degree angle. I want to do the the 45 degree angle first, that was 21.2. So 21.2 times T plus one half times A is negative 9.8 times T squared. I'm gonna give you a second to catch up with me with the writing, which is now ironic because I said earlier you didn't have to write this. Well, it turns out you do. I'll remember that for next year. So anyways, the reason why I wanna focus here is because this is where the problem gets really interesting. 0 equals 21.2t, 1 half times negative 9.8 is minus 4.9t squared. Now, I'm going to ask you guys, how do I solve for t? Because this is t squared, which means you can either factor it or you can use the quadratic formula. The answer is you can factor it if you factor out a t. Watch this. If you factor out a t, what's left in parentheses? You got 21.2 minus 4.9t. And how did I do that? Because whenever you factor out something, it's the same thing as like dividing it like this. And 21.2t divided by t, the t's just cancel. And 4.9t squared over t, one of the t's cancel, leaving you with just 4.9t. So this works. Now what you want to do is you want to set both equal to zero. The first solution you get is just t equals zero. That's that t. And that doesn't make sense to have a time of flight of zero. So that's an extraneous solution. You can cross that one out. 
The other solution is you get when you plug in 21.2 minus 4.9t equals zero. You just add 4.9t to both sides, divide by 4.9, and you're going to get a time of 4.33 seconds. So again, this is the time of flight for the 45 degree angle. And now we have to do the same thing, but for the 60 degree angle. So for the 60 degree angle, same thing, same equation, delta y equals v initial times time plus one half at squared. Delta y zero equals v initial is 26 times t plus one half times negative 4.9 t squared. Okay, same idea, factor out the t, 26 minus, oh, whoops, I already did the one half, that was my bad. That's 9.8, and then when I multiply by one half, that's when it's 4.9, I apologize for that. And that's minus 4.9 times t. Any questions so far? Okay. Now again, I'm saying this equal to zero. I get two solutions. The first one is t equals zero, which doesn't make any sense. So then 26 minus 4.9t equals zero. You do the same thing as before. I'm not gonna bother. You get a final answer of t equals 5.31 seconds. And again, that's for the 60 degree angle. So then is the answer 60 degrees? Well, no, not yet. Because even though it's got a bigger time, the question wasn't asking about time, it was asking about distance, right? Time was part A. Yes, we just confirmed from what I said earlier, the 60 degree angle does have a bigger time, like we said it would. But now if you wanna compare the distances, we gotta go back here and we gotta use this equation right here. So for the 45 degrees, we just found the time. We said it was 4.33 seconds. If you don't remember, just rewind the video and you'll see we got time it was 4.33 seconds for 45 degree angle. So if you wanna solve for delta X, Delta X equals, just multiply both sides by 4.33. So 21.2 times 4.33, you're gonna get a distance of Delta X equals 91.8 meters. I shouldn't circle that, that's not the final answer, but that's how far it is for the 45 degree angle. And then for the 60 de degree angle doing the exact same thing, VX, remember VX for the 60 degree angle is 15, equals Delta X, over the time, which is 5.31, just multiply both sides by 5.31, delta x equals 15 times 5.31, and you plug that in your calculator, and you'll get 79.7 meters. That's shorter. Looks like the 45 degrees goes further. And if you want to know a fun fact, 45 degrees is the farthest you can go. In other words, if you want to throw a ball as far as possible, you should throw it at 45 degrees because that's theoretically where it would go the farthest. And there's a proof for that, and it uses calculus. And for those of you taking my calculus summer course, I just don't think you're ready for that yet. Um, we haven't even gone over the topic yet. But theoretically, you could solve it by the end of the summer. So if you're interested, I'll, I'll explain in, a, in another video, I guess. But that's it for today. Hope you all enjoyed yourselves. If you have any questions, stick around after the lesson. If not, have a great rest of your night, and I'll see you next week.